The headlines tonight, Heseltine's teeth removed to boost pound, Branson's clockwork dog crosses Atlantic floor, and sacked chimney sweep pumps boss full of mayonnaise. These are the facts. Let's kick the stick from the blind man of ignorance. Welcome. On the day today tonight, David Owen emerges shattered from Oliver Reed. I, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite such, uh, so totally wanton, uh, ghastly, mess, terrible. And John McGregor describes how he was reassured by the king of an alien spaceship that mankind's survival was not threatened by their plans to blow up the Earth. He has suggested one or two steps which we ought to take, all of which we've taken, uh, which he describes as dealing with a remote theoretical risk, but we've taken them in order to ensure that there is no risk to humans. London Transport say they may have to close the underground system because of an infestation of horses. A report published yesterday described the effects of the equine plague as like an abattoir in a power cut. Ted Moore reports. For years, the system of tunnels and shafts has harboured a small population of wild horses without bothering the commuters. The only pest control necessary was performed by the teams of fluffers, who to this day remove clots of hair from the tracks. See, see the hair. Then in 1970 came the crackers, special staff who had to patrol the darkened tunnels every day and kill the horses with hammers. But now, say officials, the horses have become a menace to a large pile of horses blocking the line at Marble Arch. All services have been cancelled. Many of the drivers are heavily traumatised. Only one today could describe the conditions. Loads of horses, at least, at least 30, I'd say. As a train approaches, they start running away from the train. Stampede in the opposite direction, like. And what the drivers say they fear most of all is a head-on collision with a blind tube mare. Well, it's instant death. Uh, comes straight through, the, straight through the cab window, crushes you to death. Personally, I think the management should round them up, get rid of them. And in a statement issued just ten minutes ago, the Home Secretary announced that he personally will be going into the tunnels this weekend, armed with a special gun. The day today, slamming the wasps from the pure apple of truth. It's five to ten. Time for sport. Hello, I'm Alan Partridge and this is Sports Desk. Football. A Nottingham Forest may soon be Nottingham D Forest, if coach Liam O'Kane has anything to do with it. He's ordered the entire team to shave their groins in an attempt to enable greater laminar airflow and reduce buckling and weaving of the tendons. The newly depilated men will be shown off to Nottingham fans this evening. On to tennis now, and the sensational young Bulgarian protégé, Mila Milandrovic, was wowing everybody in Southampton this afternoon as she prepares for the finals of the Ordnance Survey Maps Cup. I was lucky enough to catch up with her this morning as she was practising with some nets. You are from Bulgari. Bulgaria. Bulgaria. I can imagine when you were small, you were probably taken away from your parents and put in a sports camp. No, my, we had the tennis school at my house and my father was my coach. You weren't put in a sports camp and trained into a tennis machine? No, I went to school. It's normal. I, I would work a lot. You must be devastated for your countrymen who are subsisting on a diet of bread, potatoes, water and... Uh, I don't know, beer. Um, do you feel guilty? No. People eat. Most of your country women tend to have affected a kind of, well, a moustache. And you, I have to say, have got a very, very sort of uh, top lip. It's quite nice. It's very nice. It's sort of very fine. And uh... well, I've never suffered from facial hair, but um, they have. Electrolysis in my country. You know. Electrolysis for dissidents. The day today, taking the news reefer and pulling like a madman.
If you're a criminal awaiting execution in the United State of Tennessee, your hope is that they throw your switch on Martin Luther King's birthday. If they do, state law allows you to choose the precise manner in which your votes are delivered. This report from Barbara Wintergreen of American news company CBN has received the best our digital transponder can give it, without, to my mind, showing any clear benefit in picture quality gain. Tennessee State Penitentiary. For some, it's death row, but for convicted mass murderer Chapman Baxter, it's the last night at Heartbreak Hotel. Baxter's an Elvis fan, and tomorrow he dies like a king. I've always been a poor boy, never done nothing with my life, always taken from any community yeah, I've ever been in. I just figure I just want to die glorious, I just want to die like the king, like the only king I was president. A special death bowl has been installed for this gruesome Presley demise. He died on the toilet full of drugs and cheeseburgers. That's the way I'm going to go. I ain't going to no electric chair. I'm going to the electric toilet. Like Presley, Baxter will gorge on cheeseburgers and drugs until he reaches 650 pounds. The historic weight will trigger the electric current and see Baxter skip dessert. Among those who will be watching Baxter get all shook up is Tennessee Presley fan club president Alvin Holler. Some people might say that this was debasing the memory of the king. Do you agree with that? No, ma'am. No. King did that himself by dying on the john in a big nappy. But a special cheeseburger line in Grim Elvabilia has gone on sale to commemorate tomorrow's pan fry. But maybe after today, that is how people will think of the king. <laughs> you can be right there. Press and protesters conduct a silent vigil outside this special disgrace land, while inside, Baxter chooses his backing vocals. I figured jailhouse rock would be kind of appropriate. Maybe Are You Lonesome Tonight always moves me that song. Thank you, Chapman Baxter, and good luck. Well, thank you, Missy. At dawn, all hope of a retrial gone down the pan, Baxter prepares to return to sender. In a few moments' time, America will watch the Presley stand-in eat a sit-down meal with a difference. And if he eats too much, he may come out in a hot flush. Are you sorry? So, as Baxter turns as blue as his suede shoes, this is very definitely one Burger King with extra fries to go. Barbara Wintergreen, CBN News at the Elvacution, Tennessee State Penitentiary. The day today. The last scintilla of doubt just rode out of town. It's 62 towards high three. Calatoli Sisters is about to roll her eyes into the business tunnel. Thanks, Chris. Take her off the monitor. I don't want to see her and face. And no let up today for British manufacturers. The quarterly reports make fairly gloomy reading. There were large profit slumps for Musters Margins and Watney Heckbulb. Transit Chris Fathom rolled to 1.6, joining activated Hedges and Walker Cadavero on a lower third rung. There was better news for Edge Ledge Wedge Barge, who mustered 2.41 up 88 very slightly, but Oxy McGee flew back a ninth, that despite a creeping bid from Michael Ryan's hotels. On the currency markets, trading soft all day with a very flat afternoon. How did the pound fare? Well, a glance at the currency cat and you can see, not too well. That's a disconcerting 47 degree slope against London. The dollar, yen and Deutschmark having a much better time of it. If we project on current form, the pound leg could become insignificant within four months, leading to an effective amputation. The cat now tripodular and any future resurgence in sterling would create a rogue leg with no hip constituency at all. Overall then, for tomorrow's markets, good evening. Slightly fractious in the nines and sevens. Chris. Well, now it's time for our special revelation report. If you mention the Church of England to anybody, they immediately think of choristers and wafers. But for some, the church packs a more deadly message. This report from Sarah Whoops. If you mention the Church of England to most people, they immediately think of the sacraments and the holy blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. But to many within the church, there is another ritual, the ritual of the bullying ritual. Ex-curate Peter Litterton was intimidated by his very first vicar. I went to the bathroom to wash after dinner and I found my flannel in the toilet. Another time I went into the bathroom and all the bristles, bar one, had been cut off from my toothbrush. Another time he put bleach in my shaving cream and Mrs. Cape stifled a giggle. I see. This is St. Barley's Church in Coventry. Barley's vicar, Bobby Skye, is a former bully himself, but has now decided to speak out. 
if a young deacon was being inordinated, then during the inordination ceremony, uh, we would hum during his sermon. So we would be going, hmm, and he would be trying to speak um, and not knowing who was humming. How we, many we were, of you were humming? About 200 of us, 200 vicars, all going, hmm. Ready? Bermuda Triangle X. Heather Collins has done a lot of popular work in the community. She too has felt the pain. I wasn't trying to eavesdrop at all. I was just getting on with my work and I could hear the bishop was taking Colin through the steps of a christening for the next day. He then took Colin by the sort of the scruff of the neck and said, I'll show you how to do a christening. I'll sort of well show you. And he just pushed his head towards the font. I said, don't do that, don't do that. This is ridiculous. And he said, I'll do a sodding sight more than that. And he just rampaged around the church. But while some are brave enough to speak out, others are still quietly being beaten up. Here in the vestry of St. Champs in Coventry, we secretly rigged up one of our cameras to record some bad ecclesiastical hurting. Hello, Paul. Evening, Bishop. Evening, What are you doing? Just tidying up after the service. So you've been folding that cassock. Do you think you've folded that properly? Hmm? Um, hmm? What do you think? I'll do it again. What do you call him? Answer the what question, him? Bishop. Now, did you fold it properly? Uh, I thought I'd folded it. I Naughty thought, Paul. I, I thought I'd folded it properly. No, I was collecting up the hymn books, books, very well, these exact books. Yes. And I was stacking them like so, yes. and I'd stacked up to my chin. I see. So I was at full, uh, really at full stretch with about 30 hymn books. And he said, come on, Peter, you can fit another one in there. I said, no, I, I can't, Reverend Cape, I really can't. And he pushed one in. He said, you can fit another one. I said, I can't. And he pulled my hair right back. I have seen Reverend Harris lift altar boys off the floor by their nostrils. <laughs> They all fell on the floor and he said, pick them up, pick them up, pick them up, yes. pick them up. And then he ran along this pew, right there, and threw the books, pick them up, pick them up. You do look a rather foolish boy, Paul. Clean it up, we'll be back later. <laughs> the bullying has got to stop. Stop the bullying. Start taking care of your flock. Pick on someone your own size. God's bigger than all of us. The time is almost exactly 17 minutes past nine. And that means that there are 3,416,400 minutes left till the end of the century. And that's the amount of time five critics and cultural commentators in a sealed studio in Kensington have to keep talking. They're called Debate 2000, and in 1990 they embarked on a 10-year discussion designed to pull into focus everything that modern man has achieved. Debate 2000 is available exclusively to the day-to-day -day through a triple-screened green cable which terminates in this studio's far left-hand wall. Well, let, let's ask then, what is a novel? A novel is a tool produced by a worker in an industry called culture. <laughs> oh, Bob and Dash. Yeah, Very I mean, clever. Honestly. Very clever. Because we can all agree that the novel is composed of words. So maybe we should discuss what, what is a word. <laughs> that, that, a word? Well, I think that's yes, a that's, bit basic. I mean, what, what are we going to achieve by that's discussing a what is that's a word? That's a word. That's several, that's a lot of words there. I, I, I don't see that's that. That's some more. If I could just, if I could just that's come in. That's, this we, is we, 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 the words, words are absolutely fine. Yeah, the, these are, are, are irrelevancies. Well, yeah, well, we have not. to actually go beyond yeah, that not. and, uh, no, please, and ask what, what is silence? Yes, yes, yes. We need to create, we need to create a discourse of silence. silence. Exactly. Yes, yes, shh, yes. Shh, shh, no, he's shh, absolutely shh, right. Shh, shh. I'm not saying. Right, if we could just move oh, on. Oh, no! We're trying to establish well, we, 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 a moment. We weren't ready just to move on. Just chattering away. Can't you just be quiet? You're not spitting on me. Debate 2000, showing that in Europe, at least, there's no disagreement about trading words. Time now for Sports Desk with Alan Partridge. Alan, you're a bit of a word man, aren't you? You like to feel a word. Um, I don't mind. I, I certainly 
words, uh, where would we be without them? We wouldn't be able to communicate and uh, certainly always handy when you're having a conversation. Yes, words, what do they feel like when they come out of your mouth? W what? What does a word feel like when it comes out? It's, well, it sort of, whoa. <laughs> what yeah, but you, does, what does a long word feel different to a short one? Yeah, certainly, long ones. Right. What about significant what? words? How do they feel? Alan. What? Well, how, do, how do significant words feel when they come out? A long, you mean long ones? Are they, are they different in texture yeah. to... Yeah. Hello, and welcome to Sports Desk with Buttress me. Buttress is uh, a yes. significant mm, word. Yeah. Alan Partridge. And it's a special desk of sport now, as we look back on some of the sporting highlights of the past sports season. So lie down, relax, and let these sports commence. When it's cycling championships you're after, you can't say fairer than the Tour de France. Dai Brandauer there in the lead, swaying from side to side in his own inimitable bike riding way. Klaus been there on the inside, pumping away with his with those gristle-like muscly legs inside the those tight lycra shorts which have become his trademark. And I don't know what this man is playing at. There's no way. Surely the judges must come down like a ton of bricks on that. Carrying bikes on top of a car is not a sportsmanlike way to run this race. You join me in the helicopter now as we look down on these cyclists that look somehow like cattle in a mad way, but cattle on bikes. And there, Sven Gunsen, closely followed by his great friend and teammate Klaus Ben. And the man with the bikes on his car is, yes, he's disqualified, as I said. And uh, Klaus Spin there wins, riding non-handed. No need for that. And it was upsets all the way in the dive championships. Greg Lagani down, double back twister, bangs his head in it, textbook, lovely. Let's see it again. He points down, up in the air, double back twister, comes down, bangs his head on the board and in, lovely. The judges surely will give him high marks for that. And how's this for a tumble? There she goes. Bounce, split over and over and over and then down and then back and over and over and over and over, back and over and over and up and down. And that bit with the hands there, not so good. I mean, I can do that. But for my money, the best punches were being pulled this season in the boxing ring. There, round four in the middle of it here with the, uh, the plucky liver puddlian and the uh, ginger boxer, as he's affectionately known to me. Thank goodness, actually, they're wearing gloves because I've witnessed bare-knuckle boxing in a barn in Somerset about three years ago and it was a sorry sight to see men goading them on in uh, such a barbaric fashion and I'm rather ashamed to say I was party to that goading and uh, two men fighting as I saw in the barn that night naked as the day they were born and fighting the way God intended wrestling at points, I don't know if you've seen Women in Love the marvellous scene by the fire to uh, kind of resemble that. I'm Alan Partridge, and that was my sporting season. Why don't you join me again for another one? Join me. Matters green now. Rosie May's environmation. Greenosphere. This is Rosie May with news from Green Earth, and Britain is soon to have its first portable cemetery. The cemetery, which opens to the size of a football pitch and features real soil, can hold up to a thousand corpses. The portable cemetery saves waste. Green on. Scientists in northern Canada have found a large hole in the horizon. The gap separating the sky from the ground has been measured as much as one mile high. Experts have temporarily tethered the sky to the earth with large winching ropes, but there are fears it could snap apart in the spring. Green. Take a look at this. Are you a qualified welder? Okay, yeah, I've got, I've got an HND, which really? qualifies me to weld, yeah. That's marvellous. Oh, brilliant. So you yeah. could, like, rebuild the underside of uh, any car if it was, like... Sh I'll do, sh I can do chassis rebuilds. Oh, I, I think that's it. the most I'll brilliant talent to have. Definitely. I think that's Definitely. one of the most brilliant talents to have. Tremendous creative, though. Yeah. It's yeah. just fantastic. It's just, it's not just common you. sense. No. This is all very yeah, interesting, I'm sure, important. but we have an agenda. So we'll talk about all your stuff. <laughs> it's it's, it's not exactly my stuff. It is the stuff. What do you mean, the stuff? The stuff that we are supposed to talk about. 
No, 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 the agenda is not so fixed as that. Sure, what, um, yes, what but the agenda does not uh, include motor maintenance. Uh, That's not what it's motor, about. We, we might be... Motor uh, maintenance is life, mate, whether you like leading, it or not. It's A to B. It's not going to get anywhere, might be leading... Well, you've got a problem with me. Please, we've got another eight years. I've not got a problem with you at all. No, I don't have. This is not a personal issue. It's not. You're personalizing it. You've looking at me before. I'm not looking at you in any way whatsoever. I am not looking at you at all. Bottom it! Shall we talk about the Berlin Wall? The day today. Whoa, heck, it's a news bulb. Today's historic agreement between Australia and Hong Kong marks a new season of hope for the future of world trade. The two countries who have spent years at each other's throats on the international market have now signed a treaty which allows trading between all parties at all levels on a restricted quota basis. I'm joined now by Martin Crace, the British Foreign Office Minister with special responsibility to the Commonwealth in London, and Gavin Hawtrey, the Australian Foreign Secretary in Canberra. Gentlemen, this is pretty historic stuff, isn't it? Well done. Uh, a future then of unbridled harmony, Australia? I'd like to think so. I hope both countries will be reaping the benefits, both financially and amicably, for many years to come. Mr. Christ, if, as in the past, Australia start to exceed their quotas, what would be your reaction? Uh, I think uh, one has to simply take a very firm line and say that, you know, uh, that's where it stops. Yes, you're both standing firm. What are you using to back yourselves up? The agreement. The agreement and force. What kind of force are you going to back yourself up with, Audrey? Well, uh, any means of reasonable force possible. When I say reasonable force, I mean sitting down... You're talking down. about weapons. He's talking about weapons, Mr. Crace, and you're sitting there in a, in a rather flabby way saying we're not actually going to do anything about weapons. I don't think Britain's ever been found wanting in circumstances such as these. You're going to have to retaliate pretty strongly against that sort of accusation, I would have thought, in a more physical way. Well, you mean an act of aggression? I certainly do. I mean, he's sitting here accusing you of goodness knows what, and you're sitting there effectively saying, oh, we'll put a sanction forward and we'll stand by it. What are you going to stand by it with? Well, sanctions will be the initial plan and then we would move on to stronger means. Such as? Well, I would have to talk to uh, certain members of the Cabinet. About? Uh, military matters. And that's all. We have spent a long time and had great cooperation over this and now suddenly you're talking about imposing sanctions and talking to your seniors about military uh, matters. This is, this is quite outside the terms of any treaty that could possibly be made between two you former members of the Commonwealth. You didn't suggest any suggestion of any kind of dip diplomatic in intervention. You suggested firm means. I think you're, I think you're interpreting Mr. Horton, my let words. let me give you a hint. Bang! What are you suggesting? You're plunging yourself into a... What do you want me to say? into a... You, you want me to say it? The word. The word. I'll say it. War. War. Gentlemen, I'm going to have to hold you there on freeze for just a second. If a war did break out, then fighting would probably start in Eastmanstown on the upper cataracts in the Australia-Hong Kong border region. Our reporter Donald Bethlehem is there now. Donald, what's the atmosphere like? Tension here is very high, Chris. The stretched twig of peace is at melting point. People here are literally bursting with war. This is very much a country that's going to blow up in its face. Well, gentlemen, it seems you have little option now but to declare war immediately. Well, clearly the time for semantics is now over. Uh, I, I can't, of course, be responsible for taking a decision like that. I have to refer to my, my superior, Chris Patton, as you know, he's in Hong Kong at the moment. Good, because he's joining us now on the line from Hong Kong. Mr Patton, do you agree with the idea of declaring a war? I'll take that as a yes. It seems it's war. Mr. Hawtrey? War it is, then. That's it, Chris. It's war. War has broken up. This is a war. That's it. Yes, it's war. Coming up over the next 20 minutes, we'll be monitoring the progress of our own flotilla of smart bombs, foremost among these with a nose-mounted camera, smart bomb Stephen. On hand throughout tonight's broadcast, Douglas Hurd. And on the front in Eastmanstown itself, newshound Donald Bethlehem. And with over 130 satellite infomometers, an even broader swerve of ground-based news operatives and the worldwide backup from the Factor Delix, the day-to-day -day will keep you far more firmly abreast of the war than anyone else by miles. 
First, the weather with Suzanne Charlton. Basically, we've got very movable uh, weather system. Oh. Movable weather system. Bollocks alert. We're all at it this morning. It was four seconds that Huge one. Huge well. airs of clouds sweeping it's bad across for her. the country. It must be difficult to see when you that far up your arm. That means between them we get some clear skies, which is much situation across in much situation. the whole That's another one. of England and Wales of and Scotland. She does one more. Get her off. Many areas. Get her off. A bright yeah. or even a sunny first thing this a morning. Sunny first thing, right? That's Let's it. Let's concentrate Take for time up. though on Kill Scotland. Kill the bitch. Back now to Eastman's town, our man on the ground there, Donald Bethlehem. Donald, what is the latest? As I swirled the last traces of toothpaste from my mouth this morning, a soldier's head flew past the window, shouting the word victory. Have you actually seen any of the fighting yourself, Donald? Today, I saw an old woman on the ground. She was lying in a pool of her own tomatoes. Donald, there seems to be some action going on immediately behind you. Could you take yourself closer towards it, please? Yes, Chris. Right uh, go in here. Bit, no, a bit further back, please, Donald. Uh, I feel very near here. Yes, but you're not near enough. Could you take yourself closer here. still? No, Surely. I want you to be so close until you can smell the news. Oh. I'm sorry, Chris. Uh, I think I've been shot. I am shot. I am shot. Yes, well, could you, could you describe your wounds, please, Donald? I... Uh, it's it's in the lower back above my leg. It's it's uh, it hurts. It, what about the I, level of pain? How much pain? How uh, much pain can substantially, you feel? it feels like I've been shot with a big knife. Ah! Now, it's customary for a journalist in your position to give us some sort of joke. What's yours? <sighs> it's quite ironic, Chris, yes. because this morning I was sick. Ah! Oh God! Help! Ah! Well, I'd just like to assure you that Donald Bethlehem is perfectly all right. The day today. Come, give torch to the news shag. Good evening. This is the day today live from the war. We've moved our operation into the battery zone. Progress on smart bomb Stephen. Good. And we've already seen a lot of fighting on the ground here. Earlier on today, we had to slip the clutches of the local militia, which we did by fooling them into standing guard over models of ourselves made out of biros and notepads, and then smuggling our bodies out inside some hospital beds. This report on the day's fighting I made short moments ago. There's something about the way these people move that tells you they are a nation at war. Look into their eyes and you can read the words, I have a reservation at the restaurant of death. It's a messy bistro with a bad name for soiling its customers' clothes. We've seen only one napkin in four days. As course after course piles up in the banquet of brutality, it's difficult for many of the clients here to relax. You can hear Those that don't leave go as mad as a pack of wild dogs. This man we found this morning pitifully trying to catch bullets in his mouth. With the air thick and rippling with bullets, everybody's nickname here is either Duck or Ah. I too now have a wound. Just a small part of the unnecessary damage which could have been avoided altogether if the politicians had got it right. The people here are confused, spending most of their time running about like idiots. Earlier today, we met a family who, thanks to this war, now have no home. A war which they feel anyway has nothing to do with them. We are mere pawns in a political game, trapped in the physical manifestation of a nonsensical clash of mere ideals between two governments tragically isolated both from their electorates and the guts-on-your-shoes reality of armed struggle. That boy is now a war orphan, one more victim of what they call here the desert confetti. I have a child about his age myself. When I phoned him ten minutes ago, I told him to move out of the house to make room for his new brother. Back now to the day-to-day -day smart bomb. Get rid of herd. Thanks. How is it for smart bomb, Stephen? Well, we can see now he's zooming in over the landscape. He's almost caressing the land there. This is a city full of people and soldiers. There's one. There he is. It's into his mouth, past the esophagus, down through the... Bang! Bang! Completely gone. Uh, no, we didn't hear the bang, of course, because the microphone is taken out in the heat of the explosion. But there, nonetheless, is one more tear on the face of the world's mother. Alan Sport. 
Thanks, Chris. And now some late-night soccer results. I'm Alan Partridge. This is Division 2. Hull Paragraph 5, Portsmouth Bubble Jet 1. Sheffield Hysterical 3, Chunky Norwich 1. Richmond Arithmetic versus Nottingham Marjorie match postponed due to bent pitch. Good night. Still to come, Douglas Hurd, but not yet, because as Britain is dragged hopping and burping into this conflict, how do our elected guardians justify the enormous cost? Some say the Minister for War has been avoiding the press for precisely this reason. But earlier on today, the day-to-day -to -day tracked him down, and I spoke to him in an exclusive way. Mr Powley, you're the new Minister for War. Any idea how long it's going to last? Um... Well, I hope not very long. I should say about 18 months, I hope. <laughs> no more. But nonetheless, you took the decision. That's right. We had to take the decision. Was anybody in Cabinet against it? Um, well, I should say yes. Can you name names? Mm -hmm. Not really. I understand your position. Yeah. Looking at the tactics in the war, what tactics will you be adopting? I would say go over and bomb them, because... Really, with your hands fight. over your ears? Yeah. So what's your scenario? You say 18 months, who's going to win? I should say the, the British would win. Can I put you on the spot and ask you to address the nation and tell them that we are going to win the war? Definitely. Definitely. Can you say that to the nation through Yes, the I would. Yes. I'm assured the nation will win this war. Minister, thank you. I'm now in transit over Eastman's town. Susanna Gekeloys is already there. This is the very heart of the conflict. The men here have been fighting non-stop for three days. We drove in at night, straight into the middle of a rocket battle. The air now is thick with what they call here the electric cornflakes. We are under strict instructions not to leave the vehicle, but to drive on through. With no cover, we ran across open space to a nearby house. There are always casualties in war. This man was injured and we had to act fast. We found a family sheltering in the back room. We had no tongue in common, but through the universal language of mutual need, I knew she was saying, come, set your equipment up in our refuge. The world must see this mess. These brave people are now sleeping, but they know that tomorrow our aerials and transmitters could make this house a prime target. Chris. Back to the war now, and in the noise and heat of what they call here the flying scissor beans, there is no optimism, or at least wasn't, until just two minutes ago when we received these pictures of a miracle from the front line less than a mile from where I'm standing. This was the scented rose in the bum gut of Satan, for here at 7.13 precisely, the fighting stopped. Soldiers who moments earlier had been shooting each other's teeth out suddenly put down their guns and joined in peaceful commune. Some played games, or like these men, planned a musical. Others built cribs, carefully forged from scraps and weapons. It's Christmas here, though you wouldn't know it from the smell. The reason for this outburst of calm lay inside a shed, for here the massed forces of two world powers were unified by nothing more than the distress of a cat stuck on a high shelf. No one knows how it got there, but these brave fighting men, moved by the simplicity of the animal's plight, decided to forget their differences and try to get it down. It was a heartwarming scene in an otherwise ghastly place. But even as the men celebrated, their heads were blown clean off. For somebody, nobody knows who, had filled the cat with nitroglycerin. Well, despite the odd story like that, it's quite clear even to the untrained eye that this war has peaked. There follows little now but the inevitable plague of refugee and human interest stories which tend to spew out in the wake of such conflicts. We'll leave a skeleton staff here to deal with that. I myself am back to London because I've had quite enough of this sickly guff. Mr. Hurd, thank you. This has been the day today, on the ground, live, in a war! The Day Today. Aware of the powerful symmetry that exists between news and history. And just time to look at some of tomorrow's newspapers. Drowned Italian wins Eurovision, that's today. The Mail go with Aristocrats Dung saves village from flood. The Mirror, 
Lord Mayor's pirouette in Fire Chief Wife Decapitation, The Sun, Robin Cock, and the New Zealand Prendergast lead with Russia elects Cobweb. You'll notice, incidentally, that the Wheeler cartoon in The Independent has There Will Never Be Another War Again, referring there to the Prime Minister's conference speech. And the Wheeler caption, Yes, there will, and it's happening now. That's it. That's the day today on the day that Boris Yeltsin told the world how he milked Mrs. Thatcher. Good night.